Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Olaker. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope. And here in the studio with us today is Noah Tucker. Noah is a specialist on identity, conflict, religion, and so forth, specifically in Central Asia. He's an associate of the George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs Central Asia Program. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So there's been a lot of change in Central Asia lately, all of these regime transitions that people were nervous about for decades have finally started, not in the way that the Kyrgyz kept doing them with actual <laughs> uh, revolutions and occasional elections, but in the sense that in Uzbekistan, the leader died and somebody else has taken his place. It's led to substantial changes. In Kazakhstan, he voluntarily semi-stepped down. It's not entirely clear. Is this uh, going better than expected, worse than expected? Should it make us worry? Should it make us feel relieved? I think it's certainly going better than expected in the sense that one of the great justifying factors for any authoritarian regime is that après moi le déluge. <laughs> if, 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 were, so if, not, if not for the leader, yeah, then everything would fall apart. And what we've seen in these cases is that the, the systems that are constructed are quite sustainable. And I think that there are others watching this very closely. Tajikistan appears mm -hmm. to be planning a, a transition along the same lines of the Kazakh model and doing its best to prepare the public for the idea that someone else truly can lead the state. So from a point of view of conflict, it is in some ways encouraging, of course, to see that, that nothing has fallen apart and nothing is on fire. But on the other hand, each of these countries faces significant problem and has significant issues that are are not being addressed in some ways in, in these transitions. And so we have not the problems maybe that, that many had feared, but the underlying mm -hmm. issues remain. So how would you characterize the problems people had feared and the problems that we actually are facing? What falls in both categories? Well, there were worries in the early 1990s, um, of course, in some of these states that you couldn't hold them together, you know, mm -hmm. that the, the, the regions may fall apart, that they would devolve into civil war, you know, this sort of thing. And, you know, one of the legacies, uh, as Tajikistan, Tajikistan did, did, in fact, <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, it, it's not for nothing mm -hmm. that these fears arose. And so we have stability and territorial integrity and these sorts of things. But beyond that, we also so see, for example, between 12 and 15,000 citizens from Central Asia choosing to travel to a war zone outside the country uh, in Syria and Iraq. And this indicates that there are certainly deeper problems underneath the surface. Can we talk a little bit about the nature of these states? You've pointed out how surprisingly sustainable they've proved. But I remember when, as a reporter, I was going in the early 90s to these five countries of Central Asia, which seemed impossibly remote from most places at the time. Uh, we were not talking about Islam to any degree. I think we hardly even realized that these post-Soviet states were Muslim. We were much more looking into, is there a, some kind of Turkic genie that will be let out of the bottle? And mm -hmm. reporters like myself would spend hours Tra tracking down Turkic nationalists in the back streets of Tashkent. And yet that seemed that whole set you, of concerns. You found him, right? I did find him. <laughs> he was a very unhappy man. He'd been hit on the head by a lead pipe by the regime. <laughs> but, but what, what's happened to that whole Turkic side of things? Was that just an illusion we were chasing? I don't think it was an illusion by any means. And it's a it's an identity that remains important to some people. It's been developed in some of the countries in a way that it didn't really go away. I mean, what, what happened in a lot of ways to the nationalist movements is that in the early 1990s, they were all essentially either co-opted by the government or absorbed um, by the government. And in, in many cases, it's a kind of combination of both. Has it become a kind of state ideology now in some cases? Not pan-Turkism, you know, per se, but nationalism, ethno-nationalism in particular, really has become the state ideology. I mean, the, the countries, even though none of them, for the most part, 
sought independence from the Soviet Union. It came to them <laughs> whether whether they looked for it or not. In uh, Henry Hale famously is called Kazakhstan's independence as the, the cause without a rebel. Um, <laughs> And this is, of course, certainly not the way the story is told today. You know, now we remember, now we laud President Nazarbayev as the father of the nation and the founder of Kazakh independence for Kazakhs as a as a nation, as an as an ethno nationalist construct. The ethnic makeup of Kazakhstan has changed considerably, hasn't it? The, the ethnic years. makeup has also changed, and this is part of this program. Several of the countries, Kazakhstan in particular, have developed a fairly broad, long term program to bring back co-ethnics who have settled in, in other parts of the world and create conditions for them to alter even the demographics of the countries. It just happened in a fairly significant way. So really, the nationalism certainly didn't go away. It became the system itself. So what is in this system with ethnic nationalism as part of the state ethos how does it happen that from places like this, you do have such large numbers of folks traveling to fight in Syria and Iraq? I mean, some estimates say that this region, uh, perhaps including also the Pacific countries, have sent more than yeah. anybody else in the world. How did that happen? Well, the answer is partly already there in choosing a very specific ethno-nationalism mm -hmm. as the basis for the state and as the basis for the political economy that determines who gets ahead and who gets left behind. That automatically creates a – not automatically creates, mm -hmm. but it, it does uh, in effect – create significant inequalities. And it also creates a system in which if you don't happen to be of the titular nationality, it's very difficult to see a place for yourself mm -hmm. within that system and to feel fully included in citizenship. Certainly, it goes beyond government policies. Right. And, and it's not just people makeup. of minority nationalities. It's not just that people of, of minority nationalities. This is very true. So nationalism certainly doesn't explain everything. But what we see in each country, is a tremendous amount of inequality as the system has developed. And we have whole sections of the country who are left behind. This is a problem that's not unique to Central Asia, and it's not a, it's not a problem that they have necessarily solved less well than other countries. I mean, this is in many ways a problem of modernization and of the rapid the rapid economic changes that we're going through now. You know, Detroit has been significantly left behind mm -hmm. from the rest of the United States. Right. You know, as as we and we see this sort of inequality and in, especially within industrialized economies all over the world. And the Central Asian countries were faced with a much more difficult task than, say, the United mm -hmm. States, because they had to reinvent themselves as an independent country and construct a political system, you know, essentially from scratch. And these things on top of negotiating all of these economic changes. So it's not to say that they did it worse than everyone else. But the system, as it has emerged, has created clear winners and some clear losers and no mechanism for changing the balance for those things. Inequality is one side of the story, for sure. But from the outside, at least, people seem to have this idea that there's an Islamic ethic that is being spread, a religious undertone to something called radicalization or violent jihadism. Well, it is the Islamic State they ran off to join. So It certainly looks that way. But mm -hmm. is that the whole story? It's not. As we're seeing in the discussion, there is no there's no one thing that tells the whole story, you know, in, in any of these things. For every ten people who go to join the Islamic State, there are ten different life stories and a lot, a lot of times ten different reasons. We can't say that Islam or Islamic identity doesn't have any role in it. But frequently the role that we see it playing is not so much as a religion or because of the spread of religious ideology of any kind or religious identity, it may have to do with a great deal of disappointment with what has been presented to people as democracy, mm -hmm. the total collapse of communism <laughs> for how it existed. And the only alternative that is available as a, as a different path is something like the Islamic State, a different theory of, of how to construct a government and how to distribute resources. And that distribution, that fairness, that concept of justice is one of the things that is particularly attractive.
attractive, especially to people who go to the Islamic State. And you've done interviews with people who have gone, people who have Mm -hmm. returned, their families and communities. You produced a documentary with Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, Mm -hmm. called Not in Our Name, that actually dug pretty deep into these things. Um, Do you see big differences based on social class, based on gender, other factors that help you slice and dice who went why? Well, the first response to that is, as we said before, there are ten people, ten stories. There are, yeah, there there Mm -hmm. are no overwhelming single factors, but there are many different pathways, Mm -hmm. you know, in these things. There's certainly a gendered element to it um, because we have, you know, large numbers of women who found themselves in the Islamic State from Kazakhstan, for example, from Tajikistan. In many cases, they didn't know where they were going. We've interviewed mm-hmm. a lot of people who said their husbands told them they were going to get, they had gotten a job offer in Turkey or a job offer somewhere else, and then they wake up one morning and find themselves in the Islamic State and don't know where they are. But there are also, you know, others who facing a situation of perpetual inequality that's made even worse because of gender injustice and gender differences looked at this as maybe the only way to to find an empowering path for themselves very unsuccessfully you know in mm-hmm. in all of these cases but then we have others who turn to islamic organizations because these were the ones that offered them safety or help. And in some cases, um, a number of women told stories about being completely deceived Mm -hmm. um, in these cases, ended up forced to work as sex workers in the Islamic State and things like that after having turned to a mosque uh, for help. So, you know, these are people who don't represent Islam or Islamic values, but women were looking for this in particular because they were placed in in a vulnerable situation. War and Peace a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we're talking to Noah Tucker about Central Asia and what's changing and what what hasn't changed. So we just talked a little bit about women. With men, one of the pathways one hears about is people who went off to fight with the Islamic State or some other group in Syria and Iraq, not from their home countries, Mm -hmm. but they first went as laborers to Russia, working in the oil industry. And it was there that they somehow decided that what Mm -hmm. they really wanted to do was go fight a religious war. How do you understand that dynamic? There are a number of different answers for this question as well. And it's Mm -hmm. difficult to say in any case, which aspect of the situation was worse. I mean, one of the most obvious is that recruiters among Central Asians were able to operate much more freely inside Russia than they were inside Central Uh Asia. This was, for a number of years, there's a fair amount of data that's established that recruiters, as long as they focused on taking people out to go Mm -hmm. somewhere else and not to cause trouble within Russia, were Mm -hmm. were allowed, at least in the first few years, um, many would argue, a fair amount of free reign to operate and recruit. And there was a great deal more exposure to recruiting, Mm -hmm. both in person and online. The online element is there as well. For a number of people, for a young 18-year-old kid coming from southern Uzbekistan in the desert, it was the first time he had an internet-equipped cell phone in 2014 Mm -hmm. when he's working in Russia. It's the first thing that most migrants buy in order to make their way in the world and keep in contact with family. And they were, particularly in those early years, met with just a tremendous amount of recruiting material and propaganda online. But we also can't ignore that for many of them, they went from an already difficult situation in their own country where they're experiencing things they perceive as injustice to an even more difficult situation in Russia where they're living as second-class citizens and sometimes experiencing outright racism or ethno-nationalism and in an an even worse position to deal with it than they were before. Now that ISIS is on the back foot at the very least, possibly in defeat, um, you've described a situation which presumably continues to obtain relating to inequality mm-hmm. and injustice. And in the past, you've you've written articles talking about that it wasn't the radicalization of Islam, but the Islamization of ra- radicalism. Mm-hmm. And what do you think is going to come next if nothing's been solved at uh, ground level? Well, the concern, yes, is that the people who went to Syria or, you know, the mobilization of so many Central Asians to Syria 
was a symptom and not the disease, and that now that there isn't an Islamic state to go to, or now that there isn't a war in Syria to go, of course, the first fear is that maybe some of these groups may begin to operate at home. I mean, we know in a lot of cases that the support, there was ground support within local communities, even in some cases in Central Asia, that hasn't gone away. So become, sometimes in our name. Sometimes. <laughs> well, this, this is true. Yeah. I mean, overwhelmingly, these communities don't certainly don't support these things. But there are groups who see very little other potential for mm -hmm. political change. I mean, this is why mm -hmm. terrorism is sometimes chosen as a tactic. So there is a real concern that unless governments sort of honest with themselves about mm -hmm. what the causes of these problems were and not put it all down to foreign missionaries or something that happened to people while they were living in Russia mm -hmm. or something along these lines, that if they don't address some of these fundamental structural issues, that the problems may happen at home next mm -hmm. time instead of outside. So the Central Asian governments have been among uh, the few that have actually let people return. Mm -hmm. And you hear the argument that we need to look at this experience, we need to look at their approaches for countries that are mm -hmm. struggling with what to do. Are they doing it right? I mean, it sounds to me that at least part of what you're saying is because they're not addressing the root causes that sent people there, or maybe they're, are they misinterpreting the root causes? How are they responding to these folks when they them home, and how should they be? I should say from the very beginning that this is – I think this is an extremely positive policy change. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very progressive policy change. And – Countries in particular like Kazakhstan that really has become the first in the world to bring essentially all of its citizens back from the conflict zone deserve a, a great deal of, of respect and support for doing this. And another one of the positive policy changes within this is embracing the idea that those who come back – not only the individuals, but their whole communities may need a different approach and different policy support. Mm -hmm. And Kazakhstani government in particular is eagerly reaching out to international partners mm -hmm. for advice and help on how to how to understand. How do to do international this. partners have a clue, though? There are some <laughs> who do. I mean, it is true, of course, that we can't turn to France and ask for <laughs> for their experience <laughs> how to do this or to the United States mm -hmm. for their experience how to do this. But in many cases, those who are demobilized from this conflict are in their individual experiences very similar to people demobilized from any conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and so certainly there are psychiatrists, psychologists, medical doctors, you know, those who have a great wealth of experience and how to help people reintegrate back into their normal lives and recover from trauma. The bigger challenge that we have to figure out, you know, as we move ahead is what to do at the community level and how to make community level changes. And the Kazakhstani government in particular appears to be really open um, to advice on how to do this. And now the burden is on us to figure out how to help. One country that seems to have developed very particular and um, strong policy towards Muslim radicalism is a big neighbour of Central Asia, China, obviously. Mm. How is that affecting all these currents of uh, sense of Islam and geopolitics and uh, the actual raw issue of the ties across the border when they can see that there's a million and a half million uh, people in camps being re-educated mm -hmm. out of their supposed Islamic, dangerous Islamic identity. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the great fear for Muslims in Central Asia is that their own governments are going to look at this and think that this seems to be a very reasonable policy. Uh, that Though putting that, all the Muslims in Central Asia in prison would uh, it, leave you with nobody. <laughs> it would. Um, and so it's it's certainly not a policy that can be directly copied. But there, are, I've met government officials from Central Asia who have looked across the border and said, well, you know, maybe we should be moving more in this direction than in the other. And over-securitizing most of your mm -hmm. citizens, the lives of many of your citizens, mm -hmm. you know, in clear majorities in most of the country that, that are finding meaning in their lives in Islam as a religion in the way that they may not in their own national identity. Mm -hmm. Or um, even those who haven't, but who might. Or, that's right. Even those who haven't, but, but might, um, certainly won't lead the country into a better or a safer direction in the long term. But it creates additional 
tension and fear and you know mistrust uh, toward the government, and particularly in in a lot of communities, and that doesn't lead to something better. You know, particularly if people chose to mobilize to Syria because they didn't see a positive future for themselves and their families inside their own country, living additionally in in this fear um, that your country may begin to follow more of the Chinese example doesn't bode well for how people make those calculations. And how are they responding to China itself in that context? Unfortunately, the governments themselves uh, in particular have responded up to this point with a what many of their citizens feel is a deafening silence. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is an issue, of course, that has sparked outrage across the world and for Central Asians, from many of whom are Uyghurs <laughs> themselves, are large Uyghur populations in, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Uzbeks are culturally very close to Uyghurs and this is an issue that they want their government to respond to. But up to this point, the amount of diplomatic and economic pressure that China is able to exert on them has inspired a, a very dramatic silence. And China is a very important country uh, for these. It is. Economically. It's a, it's a critical trading partner. Um, many of the countries owe billions of dollars um, to China in loans. And so there is there's a great deal of leverage that China holds over them. And does anybody hold any counter leverage? Because in You've described ethno-nationalist regimes, and but we from the outside have always tended to see Central Asia a bit of a, as a sort of cohesive unit, you know, which I imagine it isn't really. But is there some sense that, like in the old days, they can play China off against Russia, can play China off against a U.S. interest in something in Central Asia, or are they becoming more and more a satrapy of China? Well, I wouldn't go quite as far as to describe it that way. But there were more opportunities in the past to sort of use Russia as a balancing partner as well and to use the United States as a balance. And unfortunately, the U.S. has chosen this as a time to take a step back from attempting to to be a player or an influencer in the region. And that leaves them certainly in a position more open to, to influence from China. And because Russia is facing uncertain economic situation and itself is spending more of its attention and investing more of its resources toward Ukraine um, at this point and to the conflict that's ongoing there, they also have, to a certain extent, turn some of their attention away from Central Asia. Russia will be back, though. Uh, the United States, arguably, right. it was never going to rival China in yeah. terms of the economic uh, weight. Well, yeah, and certainly not without a very developed policy and, and a clear and consistent intention. And in the 1990s, I think we invested much more of our time and attention and economic resources into the region. And you know, unfortunately, one of the reasons that policy changed probably is because a, a great deal of that energy and investment went into Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. And then after the collapse in the relationship after Andijan, it went quite badly yeah. for American businesses that invested there. And many of the institutions that from, you know, university programs mm -hmm. and language schools and things like that collapsed during that time. And at that point, attention or time had shifted and we didn't really, the United States didn't particularly reinvest mm -hmm. that energy and resources into, into other Central Asian mm -hmm. countries in a similar way. And Europe? Well, the EU is developing a, a cohesive policy mm -hmm. towards Central Asia and, and reviewing um, there. And, you know, in many cases because in particular in Uzbekistan that sort of collapse in relations was not as dramatic with say Germany mm -hmm. and Uzbekistan um, the partnership was a little bit more enduring and as opportunities to go to the United States for university students to study and, and things like that have suffered from lack of funding and things like that Europe has certainly become an alternative to that for Central Asians looking outward but the degree of investment and engagement is also not what it was in, in the 1990s. 
Noah, thank you so much. Uh, this was fascinating for me and I hope also for our listeners. So that closes this segment of War and Peace. Thanks, as always, to Antoine LaRue at uh, Bull Media, our producer. Uh, thanks to Miranda Sonnex, who keeps this all going at Crisis Group. Thank you to our listeners. And thanks from me, Hugh Pope. And also uh, do catch up on all our reports about the region on www.crisisgroup.org. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.